All right, we are going to start in Ezekiel here this morning, Ezekiel chapter 38. And good morning to everyone in Tehachapi who's tuned in live to us. Welcome to a City on a Hill Church, or Satellite Church up in Tehachapi. Ezekiel chapter 38, and we're going to read verses 14 to 17. I'm not sure if I'm going to get through this whole message this morning. I may break it up into two messages and do the second part on Wednesday night, actually. Um, But our series that we've been studying here for the last six weeks, six prior weeks, this makes seven, the seventh message here in this series, uh, is the promises and the covenants of God. And it's been, a, 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 I think, a very interesting, informative series, specifically related to Israel being back in the Holy Land in the last days. And all of the things that God predicted would happen, we see are happening around us in the world. But uh, Israel back in the land and all of the promises that God made to Israel, some of which have been fulfilled, some of which have yet to be fulfilled, I believe we are living in those days very, very uh, close to the return of Jesus Christ. No one knows the day or the hour, but Jesus said you will be able to discern the times and the seasons uh, before I return. And I believe we are living in those times and those seasons. So this message is entitled, War and Peace in the Middle East. War and Peace in the Middle East. And this is the final message. It may be a part one and part two of this message. We'll see. But the final message in the series, the promises and covenants of God. So we're going to read Ezekiel 38, verses 14 to 17. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company, and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days, or the last years, that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Verse 17, Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? Now, last week we looked at the resurrection of the nation of Israel. Fascinating prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 37. Incredible prophecy, actually, as God showed the prophet Ezekiel the Holocaust and what would happen to the nation of Israel in the last days prior to their being reborn as a nation and brought back into their holy land, which of course uh, happened in our lifetimes, some of our lifetimes here in uh, 1948, May 14th, 1948, or you could go back to November 29th of 1947 when the United Nations ratified the vote to allow Israel to become a nation. Uh, It's just happened in the last 70 or 75 years, and so very, very recently as Bible history goes. And that is one of the indications and the signs that you are living in the last days. If you are the generation that Israel is resurrected as a nation, the Bible says pay attention because this is a major super sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the prophecies of the Messiah uh, being fulfilled. So we read here... Uh, that this war is coming. It's going to come in Israel. After Israel has come back into their land, they're going to be attacked uh, from the north. There's going to be many peoples that are going to descend upon Israel, and uh, they're going to cover Israel like a cloud in the last days or in the latter days. And God says that the purpose of this is so that I'm going to be hallowed, or I'm going to be honored, or I'm going to be 
uh, magnified. You read in verse 23 of Ezekiel 38, he says, Thus I will magnify myself, I will sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And so this is a, a war, a future war that has not yet happened, as we're going to see here uh, this morning. But when it happens, the whole world is going to know that there is a God in Israel who defends his holy land and his people. Now, in the book of Hosea, in Hosea chapter 15, the prophet says this, the Lord speaking, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And so the Lord is saying, once the nation of Israel acknowledges their offense against me and they begin to seek my face at the time of their affliction, which I believe is speaking of the time right uh, before 1948 when Israel was established as a nation. So specifically the time of the Holocaust where the, the Jews were being hunted down and they were being exterminated by the Nazis all over Europe and into Russia and uh, really Hitler wanted to kill all the Jews all around the world. So God is saying uh, when they acknowledge their offense, the nation of Israel, when they seek my face in their time of affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And indeed the Jews did earnestly seek God during the time of their affliction. Uh, and then we read in chapter 6 and verse 1 of Hosea, he says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So this is a national cry of Israel after they have been afflicted, after they have been punished, after they have been scattered and they look like just a bunch of dry bones. They're saying, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He has smitten us, but he will bind us up. It's interesting that the prophet says, Hosea says, after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. We know that the Bible says, for God, a day is like unto a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Psalm chapter 90 tells us this. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us this. So our time is not like God's time. A thousand years of our time on earth is like one day in heaven. A day is like a thousand years for us. So when they say after two days, prophetically, they, it could be speaking of 2,000 years, which is the amount of time that the Jews were scattered around the nations from 70 AD until really 1948, almost 2,000 full years. They were scattered to the nations, and then they were revived, and they were resurrected, as we saw last week in Ezekiel 37, and brought back to their land and brought back as a nation from the dead. Even their language was resurrected, and ancient language that had pretty much died out. The, the language of, of Hebrew was resurrected, and now in Israel, everybody speaks Hebrew. Uh, it's required if you want to become an Israeli citizen or you want to uh, come back to the land uh, under their Aliyah laws where any Jew can come back for free and come back and live in the Holy Land, but they have to learn the language of Hebrew. It was a dead language for almost 2,500 years from the time that the Jews were carried away captive in Babylon in 586 B.C. So on the th he says after two days he's going to revive us or bring us back. On the third day he will raise us up. Some see in that the third day speaking of the thousand-year reign of Christ. That when Christ reigns for a thousand years, it is the day of the Lord, and it is the day when God is going to be reigning and ruling over the earth for 1,000 years, which for God is just like one day. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. Now, you will recall from last week's message in Ezekiel 37 and verse 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold on my peoples, I will open your graves, I will cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. 
Verse 13, then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and have performed it, says the Lord. And so God says he's going to call them back. He's going to resurrect them, as it were, from the dead. He's going to bring them back from the nations into their own land. Uh, the land of Israel. And then he says, uh, I'm going to put my spirit in you and you will live. So first there is the physical, national resurrection of the nation of Israel, physically, nationally back in the land. And then subsequently there is the spiritual resurrection of the nation of Israel and the, and the national salvation for the Jews. So they're going to be brought back into the land as we see they were in unbelief into this day. The majority of the uh, Israeli people are not religious people. The overwhelming majority of the Israeli people are secular. A lot of them are agnostic or atheist. They are not back in the land right now as certainly not believing in Jesus Christ. I mean, although there are many, many Jews who are trusting Christ more than ever before, really, uh, Israelis and Jewish people who are turning to Christ in these last days. But uh, they are in the land right now in unbelief. They have a small percentage of very religious Jews, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the population is extremely orthodox, extremely religious, but the overwhelming majority of the population is secular, which is exactly what we would expect because God said they're going to be reborn first physically, nationally, and then secondarily they will be reborn spiritually. And he says, I'll put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land and then you will know that I am the Lord. Back in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 24, God says, For I will take you from among the nations. I will gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. So you have the physical, national resurrection and salvation and then you have the spiritual uh, resurrection of the nation. We've already seen the nation physically resurrected, nationally resurrected again in 1948 after the Jews were scattered all over the world for almost 2,000 years. Now they are back in their homeland and they continue uh, to come back to their homeland from all over the world. Now in Ezekiel chapter 39, we read this, Ezekiel 39 and verse 27. God says, When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land. And left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore. For I sh shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord. So we know that this is coming. This national salvation for the Jews. Spiritual revival. Spiritual salvation for the Jews is coming. It's imminent. We've seen part of the prophecies fulfilled. Uh, there are still a few of these prophecies that will be fulfilled later when Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom. And then after uh, this war that we're going to look at here this morning, uh, the war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, from Ezekiel 40 onward, you have the millennial reign of Christ described, the messianic reign of 
Jesus Christ from Ezekiel chapter 40 uh, all the way through the end, uh, uh, through 48. And you read there even the dimensions of the new temple that are going to be built uh, and what uh, uh, the geography is going to look like in Jerusalem. The king will be reigning from Jerusalem over all the nations of the earth. This is still yet future. So we're kind of like right in between the prophecies been, being fulfilled. We've seen a whole bunch of these prophecies already fulfilled uh, in 1948. Uh, and then some of them have yet to be fulfilled. So we're kind of like right in that in-between time uh, related to the prophecy. You have to remember, uh, this prophecy was written almost 2,600 years ago. So for God, you know, 50 years or 100 years is not a lot of time for prophecies to be fulfilled. God's outside of our space-time continuum. Now, it is interesting that one of the uh, prophecies that Jesus spoke of, and this, uh, I was asked about this actually after the service last week, about the prophecy of the fig tree blossoming. Uh, it, it's an interesting prophecy that some see Israel's rebirth in Jesus' prophecy of the fig tree budding in the last days. In Luke chapter 21, I'll read this to you, uh, verse 29, Jesus said, Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away." Jesus here is speaking about the tribulation period. He's speaking about the things of the last days, uh, specifically uh, the tribulation period and the great tribulation period. But when he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees and when they're budding, uh, many Bible scholars and, and prophecy scholars say that this is a reference to the nation of Israel. That the fig tree was a representation of the nation of Israel. And sometimes God did uh, uh, call Israel a, like a fig tree in his garden in the Old Testament in Isaiah and Jeremiah, for example. Um, and so it's possible that this is what Jesus was referring to. Because you remember Jesus earlier cursed the fig tree because it wasn't bearing fruit. It had only leaves and it should have had figs on it by that time. And because it didn't, Jesus cursed it and said, there'll be no more fruit on you. Uh, because the fig leaves just represent dead religion, like when Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves, man's religion. And so he was saying to the Jews, you're just, there's no fruit in the nation of Israel. It's just religion. And so he cursed the fig tree that it would not bear fruit again. Well, here he's talking about the fig tree budding or coming back to life from a state of dormancy. So many scholars say that this is a, is, is a type or a picture nation of Israel coming back into their land and being resurrected, the fig tree budding. Uh, and it's interesting that he says in all the trees. And so what is he talking about? If the fig tree is Israel, what are all the trees? I did some research this week. If you go and look at how many nations have been created since 1947, uh, it's, it's scores of nations that we see on our maps today that didn't exist before 1947. After World War I, when the Ottoman Empire was broken up, a whole bunch of uh, nations were created then, but they were under the mandates of the British and the French and, uh, uh, and others. And so uh, after World War II, then all of these nations became independent, even independent of the British Empire, the French uh, Empire, etc. So when it says that the fig tree is going to bud and then all these other trees are going to bud, if it is speaking about a nation being born or a nation being created, we've seen more nations created in the last 75 years on our map than at any other time in human history uh, because of all the wars and uh, all of the divisions of the lands and nations that were created out of the USSR, for example, uh, when the Soviet Union broke up in 1989, 1990. Uh, uh, East Africa broken up, which was a British empire, and then uh, you know, all of these nations throughout East Africa and the Middle East and so forth. So it is an interesting thought that even Jesus 
was uh, referring to the nation of Israel, saying, when you see the fig tree budding, when it comes back to life, know that those who see this happen, that generation will not pass away. So many people think that those who were born to see the nation of Israel rebuilt will still be alive when the rest of these prophecies come to pass. We don't know. We can't put a date on it. Uh, but certainly we know we are getting ever closer uh, to the fulfillment of all of these prophecies of the coming of Jesus Christ. So we are back in Ezekiel chapter 38, and let's start in verse 1. Ezekiel 38 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, the word Gog means ruler. Uh, the word Magog means the head or the top. And so, uh, and, the, and the word Magog in the Hebrew is Rosh. So it's kind of talking about a king or a ruler or the head of a government uh, or, or a dictator, somebody who's in charge of an area. And we know that this is speaking of the land of Russia. Uh, there, there are many people who have done studies in the words here. Some see uh, the word Meshach where it says Rosh. Rosh means Magog. Some think that, that Russia came from the word Rosh. Uh, it's, it, it, it's possible, I suppose. But Meshach uh, uh, be, is believed to have been the Muscovites, uh, which was Ivan the Terrible. And the, the Muscovites became uh, the Moscovites or Moscow. And so uh, we know... Even later, Ezekiel tells us these are the nations coming from the farthest parts of the north. That would be from a map of Israel, standing in Jerusalem, looking on a map to the north. At the farthest part, you see Russia, the, the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, Siberia, and so forth. All this land controlled by Russia. So we know that these nations are coming from the area of Russia even before Russia existed. Russia didn't exist in 2600 BC as a nation, but there were certainly people that were living there in that land uh, at that time. And uh, they've always been powerful people that come out of this land of the north there uh, in, in the modern day Soviet Union. So these were the ancient Scythians is what we're told. And this today, the land is the land of Russia on our maps. So when God is saying, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Um, we, we know that this is the area uh, of modern-day Russia. He says this in verse 4, I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So there is this army that's going to invade Israel in the last days from the far parts of the north after Israel had been scattered to the nations and given up as dead and then resurrected and brought back into their land. Uh, then you're going to have this army that's going to attack them from the north. It's interesting that it says there's going to be an innumerable army and horses and horsemen uh, and shields and so forth. Some, you know, of course, in Ezekiel's day, they didn't have tanks and they didn't have machine guns and so forth. Uh, some people think that this is just speaking of uh, like uh, cavalry and, and, and fast moving troops and so forth. Some Bible scholars believe it's literally going to be horses. Apparently, Russia still has uh, one of the strongest uh, uh, cavalries with horsemen in the world. They still train because of the terrain up there in Siberia and Russia. They have cavalry units that uh, uh, are ready to go. And so whether it's speaking of literal horsemen coming or whether it's speaking of what the equivalency would have been like horsemen and chariots in their days, uh, it's going to be an overwhelming attacking force that's going to be coming from the north to attack the nation of Israel. 
It's interesting, it says that they're going to, God says, I'm going to put hook in, hooks in your jaws and, and lead you out. So some scholars believe that this is related to the fact that Russia has these uh, treaties with some of these nations that are around Israel. For example, uh, there is a treaty that Russia has with the nation of Iran. We're going to see here that Iran is one of the nations that are going to come against Israel in this attack. And so theoretically, uh, if the Iranians went to war, the Russians would have to go to war because they have a treaty. They have a pact with Iran to fight with them and to fight for them. Uh, I believe uh, the Russians had that same deal with Syria, which is why the Russians came in to help Syria and Assad during the civil war. Had the Russians not come in, Assad would have been overthrown and that dictator would have been removed from Syria. But Russia came in and backed him up because of a uh, non-aggression treaty, a defense treaty that they had with them. So it's, it, it looks like Russia is not necessarily going to want to fight in this war, but they're going to be compelled. God says, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw. You're going to be compelled. You're going to have to do this, uh, probably because of these treaties that they are a party to. Now, we're given some uh, of the other nations that will be attacking in verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia, or Cush was the original name. And Libya, or the original name was put, are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togermah from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. So this is going to be a confederacy of at least um, four or five different armies. We know that it's going to be the Russians. The Persians are modern-day Iran. The Ethiopians, or Kush, um, are likely speaking of modern-day Sudan. This was the area of ancient times Ethiopia. If you look at a map from the 1920s, 1930s, Ethiopia was really the name of all of East Africa. And then it was broken up after World War II, and the British Empire broken up, as I was talking about earlier. And now that area is modern-day Sudan. And then you have Libya, which is still Libya. And so you have those, five, those four nations, and then... Um, Gomer and Togoma is the area directly to the north of Israel, which is modern-day Turkey. So it's interesting that we have all of these nations named. I've been teaching on this for 25 years, uh, and I've seen it come together just since my lifetime as a pastor, teaching on these prophecies. Um, Russia was not in the land 20 years ago north of Israel. They are there today. They're there fighting Syria's civil war. They're also there uh, supporting Turkey, uh, as we're going to see here in a minute. The, all of these alliances, Russia and Iran are friendly. They have uh, allegiances and alliances together to support one another. And so you have Iran in Lebanon through Hezbollah operating against Israel. You have Iran in Syria operating also through Hezbollah, and they're arming uh, Assad, and they're arming the Syrian government who's fighting against ISIS and some of these other countries, Russia supporting them as well. Um, then you have Turkey who is trying to rebuild the Ottoman Empire. You have Erdogan who's just kind of running rampant all over the Middle East trying to recreate what was once the great Ottoman Turkish Empire. Uh, so what are the odds? You have all these nations. Libya, of course, uh, is also a Muslim country that uh, does not like Israel. Uh, and then you, of course, have Turkey uh, that is a Muslim country that does not like Israel. Sudan is a Muslim country that does not like Israel. Um, Iran, a Muslim country that wants to exterminate Israel. And then Russia, coming from the north with all of its power, military power, is somehow uh, coerced into this or compelled to fight in this war. There's hooks in their jaws. They may not want to fight this war, but they're going to. So it, it is just amazing to see that all of the players are in place. And these are not the nations that you would predict would be coming against Israel. As a matter of fact, Persia, uh, which is in verse 5, Persia was the friend of the Jews uh, almost throughout all of their whole history. The Persians were always friendly to the Jews. I mean, you had the King Cyrus, who uh, was Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire. You had Harris, who was the uh, uh, husband of Queen Esther, and Artaxerxes, uh, the king who gave permission 
uh, for them to go and rebuild the temple and rebuild uh, the city of Jerusalem. The Persians were always uh, friendly to the Jews, actually, uh, up until modern times. It's only since 1977, 78, 79, when the Islamic revolution and the Ayatollah Khomeini overthrew the Shah, who was a secular leader and a Western-style leader. They overthrew him, pushed him out, and drove him into exile, took over the government, and formed a theocracy, a Muslim Shiite theocracy to rule the Muslim world. 1979. So up until 1979, when, when Bible scholars would read this, and pastors would preach this sermon that I'm teaching you right now, they would say, well, uh, Persia is going to change and become an enemy of Israel at some point. And people would think, well, Persia is like the only friend that Israel has in the Middle East, which was the truth. After their founding, uh, the Persians were their friends. Uh, they weren't against them. But in 1979, that all changed. And now, Persia has changed their name to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and they are a theocracy run by the sheikh, run by the Muslim uh, 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 leaders. And they hate Israel, and they want to destroy Israel, and they have it as their mission to drive the Jews into the Mediterranean Sea. They support uh, the rebels in, in, in Hamas against the Jews. They support Hezbollah, uh, etc., and so all of the players are here. All of the pieces are, are in place. Now, it's interesting who is not attacking Israel. It's not the usual suspects. It's not Syria. Um, it's not Assyria or modern-day Iraq. Um, it's not Egypt. It's not Saudi Arabia. It's not some of these other nations. It's not even Lebanon, which is right on their border. It's not Jordan. Their usual enemies that they fought in the War of Independence in 1948, the Six-Day War in 1967, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, those were their enemies that were on their borders, and they won all of those wars. But these are not the usual enemies. These are people that never really have messed with Israel before and come against them. Even Turkey, up until just the last 15 years, Turkey was the last friend that Israel had in the Middle East. You know, true friend. They were, again, like Iran, Persia, before it was changed to Iran. It was a secular nation in the middle of a Muslim country. Not anymore. Now Erdogan wants to become, they call him Sultan Erdogan, he wants to rebuild the Ottoman Empire, which was the most powerful empire in that part of the world for 400 years, up until the end of World War I. And he's trying to reconquer the land that belonged to them. And guess what part of the land belonged to the Ottoman Empire? Jerusalem and Israel for 400 years. So he wants that land back for the Muslims. And uh, he is trying to find, desperately trying to find natural gas in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you know, Turkey, who was an ally to the Jews up until 15 years ago, now is a, a very dangerous, real threat to them. As a matter of fact, uh, there are warships throughout the Mediterranean Sea that they've never seen there since World War II. You have the Greeks, you have the Russians with their submarines, you have Turkey with their aircraft carrier and their helicopters. They're all looking for natural gas underneath the ocean because Israel discovered natural gas there. And Israel has made all of these alliances to get their natural gas from the Mediterranean Sea and to pipe it into Europe, which is a huge threat to Turkey. Turkey supplies some of the natural gas, or at least it comes through the land of Turkey uh, from the area of Armenia into Europe. And the Russians supply natural gas primarily to the Europeans. So the Russians have a lot of power over the Europeans because of their natural gas. So Israel is coming in and saying, we'll meet the natural gas needs for Europe, and they already are. They built pipes, and they're delivering natural gas through the Leviathan oil field uh, all the way into southern Italy. And from there, they want to build pipes from Italy up into Western Europe. This is a threat to Turkey financially. It's a threat to Russia financially, and which is interesting. We're going to be told that the reason these nations are going to attack Israel in the last days, is for spoils of war. It's not 
uh, an existential extermination mission where they're trying to kill the Jews just because they're Jews or drive them into the Mediterranean Sea because they're not Muslims. This is purely for financial reasons that this war is going to happen. And again, you see all the players in place. You even see the French that are down there. Uh, you have Cyprus. You have Greece. All of these armies and navies are there in the Mediterranean Sea and it's, uh, you know, one accident away from World War III potentially with all these nations and their interests and all of their military hardware there. But what's interesting is the Russians are there in the Mediterranean Sea. They've always wanted a warm water port. The Russians, uh, you know, it's, they say that the, the Russians play chess and the Western nations play checkers. I mean, the Russians are always thinking 100 years down the road and they have plans to conquer the world. Uh, so, do, so do the Chinese. And they're playing the long game. So with Russia in Syria today, right on Israel's border, you have Iran in Syria and in Lebanon on two of uh, Israel's border. And then you have Turkey's Erdogan that's trying to rebuild uh, the Ottoman Empire. As a matter of fact, he's converting churches, ancient Orthodox churches, into mosques. He just converted another ancient church, one of the oldest churches. I think it was built in the 4th century A.D. in Turkey. Uh, he's converting it to a mosque. It was a Christian museum. Uh, it was a church and then a museum uh, after the Ottoman Empire. So uh, the Haggai Sophia was another ancient church that he took over just recently, like three months ago, and turned this beautiful ancient uh, uh, cathedral into a mosque. So they're trying to stamp out the roots of Christianity uh, throughout Turkey uh, and throughout uh, the, the old Ottoman Empire. We read in verse 7, he says, Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your comp uh, companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard to them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter days you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So we're, giving, we're given some specific information here from God. After many days, remember a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. In the latter years, that's always speaking about the days that are uh, the preparatory days for the day of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the latter years, the last days. You're gonna, you will come into the land of those who were brought back from the sword, and they were gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. So they were scattered to the nations for 2,000 years, the Jews were. They've been restored to their land in our lifetime. The land had been desolate. Now it's like the Garden of Eden, as God predicted it would be in Ezekiel chapter 36. And he says um, they were brought from the nations, and now they're dwelling safely. Israel has never been dwelling more safely than they are today. Israel is one of the safest nations in the world, actually. People are always scared to go to Israel. I remember when we went to Israel in 2015, uh, I was one of the two pastors who led the tour and did the teachings there. Uh, and people were always scared to go to Israel. They think it's dangerous and, you know, it's going to be suicide bombers on every corner or what have you. But it's actually the safest nation in the world because they have the best military in the world. They have the best communication systems in the world. They have the best artificial intelligence in the world. Uh, they, they, they have the best intelligence, period, in the world. So uh, they know what's going on all the time. And they have all of these technologies that... Uh, their military does that they've developed that the world doesn't even know about, that they will bring out if they need to bring them out uh, to defend their people. So Israel today is dwelling safely. As a matter of fact, they're making peace deals with their enemies. As you know, they just made a peace deal with the United Arab Emirates, which means that they had the blessings of Saudi Arabia, who is the main Sunni power. The Iranians are a Shiite power. They're at war with the Sunnis. The Saudis are the Sunni power in the Middle East, uh, and, and, or the Saudis. And so the Saudis uh, have permitted United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Oman, and some of these other Gulf nations to strike peace deals uh, and economic treaties with 
Israel. So the nations that used to be the enemies of Israel are now their friends. They're doing deals with them. They're trading with them. For example, Egypt. Egypt was their enemy for so many thousands of years. Well, now Egypt is like a, uh, an ally to them, although maybe not a military ally. They're an economic ally. They ship natural gas to Egypt from Israel. They ship natural gas to Jordan, which was once Transjordan, once one of their enemies. Syria is in a bloody civil war, and they're totally impotent and, and totally powerless. Lebanon is collapsing under the corruption of Hezbollah. So their enemies that are on their border are powerless to hurt them or they're allied with them now. The Lebanese, the Syrians, the Jordanians, the Egyptians. And now you have the Gulf states that are uh, accepting the existence of the nation of Israel, recognizing uh, the existence of the nation of Israel like no time in history. Israel is having peace with its ancient enemies that you would think would be their enemies, but the war is being set up and the players are in place for these other nations to come that are going to attack Israel from the north. Russia, Iran, and Turkey being the primary uh, players in that war. We know it's coming in the latter days. We know that we would expect to see that Turkey uh, would be there and that Russia would be there on Israel's uh, doorstep. And so I'm going to read just a couple of quick articles here these are actually from late last year, uh, but related to Israel's gas production and how it's a threat to uh, uh, Russia and to Turkey. This is from a Reuters December 31st article from last year, uh, 2019. And it says, Israel's Leviathan gas field begins production. And uh, Israel's offshore Leviathan natural gas field has begun production. The companies running the project said on Tuesday after numerous delays pushed off operations in the past weeks. Leviathan, Israel's largest gas field, is controlled by Noble Energy, Delic Drilling, and Ratio Oil. The delivery of gas from the project will effectively double the amount of Israeli-produced gas, the company said in a statement. The field's discovery in 2010 helped turn Israel into a potential energy exporter. The project's partners have already signed major multi-billion dollar export deals to Egypt and to Jordan. Gas exports are expected to begin in the coming weeks, and since then they have begun, and Israel is now providing energy for their former enemies, for the Jordanians and for the Egyptians, and now actually into Italy and southern Europe since this article was written. Uh, a second article from Reuters related to Turkey and their allegiance with Russia. Uh, this is from November 4th, 2019. Turkey says delivery of second Russian S-400 batch may be delayed. Delivery of a second batch of Russian S-400 missile defense systems to Turkey may be delayed beyond a planned 2020 timeline by talks on technology sharing and joint production, the head of Turkey's defense industry directorate said on Monday. NATO allies, Turkey and the United States, have been at loggerheads over the purchase of the S-400 system, which Washington says is not compatible with NATO defenses and poses a threat to its Lockheed Martin F-35 fighter jets. Despite Washington's warnings and threats of U.S. sanctions, Turkey started taking delivery of the first batch of S-400 in July. In response, Washington has removed Turkey from the F-35 program in which Ankara was a manufacturer and a buyer. Washington still hopes to persuade its ally to walk away from the Russian systems. Despite the threat of U.S. sanctions over Ankara's move to buy the Russian systems, Turkey has indicated it could procure Russian fighter jets if the United States refuses to deliver the F-35 jets it has purchased Russia had already offered to sell Turkey its Su-35 fighter jets. Ties between Ankara and Washington have been strained over issues such as Turkey's offensive in northeastern Syria. The, 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 the stage is totally set for this war to happen. Turkey is now backing away from Europe, backing away from the Western alliances, and beginning to buy defense uh, uh, equipment from the Russians and make its allies with the Russians instead of with NATO and with America and with uh, the Western European nations. So 
Um, you know, again, all of this stuff is happening in the last 15, 20, 30, 40 years. These prophecies that we've been looking at, they're fulfilled in our lifetime. Some of them are being fulfilled right now with Turkey and Russia and Iran setting up the stage for this war in Israel. He says in verse 9, you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass, the thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So they're going to come in the land after Israel's been restored, regathered from the nations, resurrected as it were, and they're going to see Israel dwelling in security. They're going to be dwelling securely in the last days. There's going to be unwalled villages. They're going to be a peaceful people. They're dwelling safely. They're not, they don't have walls around all of their little villages, and they don't have bars or gates. Now, it's very difficult to get into Israel, but once you're there, you can pretty much travel anywhere you want safely uh, around Israel. It's very, very safe. Once you get into the country, you're safe. They protect you. Uh, outside of their boundaries, uh, not so safe when you get into the Palestinian areas. But uh, when you're in Jerusalem or you're traveling in Israel with a tour company, you are very, very safe. They are a peaceful people who are dwelling safely. As a matter of fact, they are prosperous. They're the eighth largest economy in the world. They have one of the best militaries in the world. They are a powerful little nation. To, I mean, considering they only have 10 or 12 million Jews there in Israel to be one of the leaders in the world economically, technologically, scientifically, militarily, and so forth. It's unbelievable, actually, considering they've only been in the land since 1948 as a nation. But that's exactly what God predicted would be the case before these nations invade. Now, he says why they're coming in verse 12. He says, you're coming to take plunder, to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. So we, we know they're not coming for religious reasons. It's not because they want to prove which God is the true God, whether it's uh, the God of the Muslims or the God of the Jews. That's not why they're attacking. They're attacking to take spoils of war and to take plunder. And we know that right now, uh, Israel is, is angering and upsetting the Turks, upsetting the Russians, uh, because they are finding all of the oil in the Middle East, uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea. The Jews are making deals uh, with Cyprus, with, with Greece, with Italy. Uh, and they are the ones who are discovering all these oil fields and natural gas fields. Uh, the Turkish lira is collapsing. The Turkish currency is almost worthless. They're desperate for money. Uh, the Iranian currency is nearly worthless. Uh, I think it's like 300,000 to one or something like that, uh, to one dollar. It's just collapsed. So Iran is desperate financially. Turkey is becoming more desperate every day financially. They need oil. They need natural gas to fuel uh, their military machine and to f fuel their economies. And they're jealous of Israel. This is exactly how Israel is dwelling today. They're safe. They're prosperous. They're peaceful. These people are going to come, these nations, to take plunder, to take booty. And they're going to come against those who were gathered back from the nations and dwell again in the midst of their land. Verse 13, he says, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, who are Sheba, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish? Well, we know that Sheba and Dedan are the nations that today 
occupy the Gulf states, the Sunni, uh, Saudi-allied Gulf states that just signed a peace deal with Israel. Uh, again, Oman and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain with the blessing and permission of the Saudi government. Now, the Saudi king is almost dead. He's 83, 84 years old. When he goes, the young king that's coming up, the prince, uh, he wants to westernize Saudi Arabia. And so he's chomping at the bit to make a peace deal with Israel. As a matter of fact, the Saudis are allowing uh, El Al Airlines, the Israeli airline, to fly, fly over their airspace for the first time in history without shooting down their planes. Uh, and so exactly what the Bible described would be the case during the time of this war is happening today. The nations that were previously the enemies of Israel are now their allies, or at least they're not their enemies. And their historic allies and friends are now their enemies, specifically Iran, uh, Persia. So he says they're going to come. They want to take plunder. They're going to come from where? From the place of the far north. If you look north of Israel on a map, first you come to Turkey. You get past Turkey, uh, and then you get into, into Russia, some of the uh, southern Baltic countries, and you get into the former USSR. And then what is Russia today? The Soviet Union, uh, the, the, the remaining uh, Soviet Union. So they're coming from the north, from Turkey primarily and from Russia. A great company, a mighty army. You're going to come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. My goodness, God tells us over and over again. He wants to drill it into us. He doesn't tell us this because he wants to uh, waste words. If he says it's going to happen in the latter days and he repeats it over and over again, it's for emphasis. It's to let you know this is the time frame. In the latter days, this is going to happen. So that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? Verse 18. And it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And so God is telling us exactly how the enemies of Israel are going to be destroyed. It's going to be natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, fire and brimstone from heaven, great rains, flooding rains that are going to fall down. Uh, it's like nature itself is going to fight against these armies because Israel's going to be all alone in this war. Uh, interestingly, prophetically, uh, today if Israel was attacked, we would defend them. But if there was a change in our political situation at the federal level, uh, we might have a president that would not support Israel if they were attacked by Russia, wouldn't want to get involved. You know, today, if Israel was attacked by Russia, President, Bush, uh, president Trump rather, uh, would be right there to defend the nation of Israel. Perhaps not the case if, if Trump is not in office next year uh, or in four years, you see. There's going to be a time when Israel is going to be all alone and it's going to be an existential threat, an existential enemy uh, that, that they're going to have to fight, and they're going to be overwhelmed by their enemies. No other nation is going to defend them. Only God is going to save them. And that's when uh, God is going to begin 
to reveal to the world his covenant with Israel. I believe, along with many, many other Bible scholars, that the rapture is going to take place of the church simultaneously when this war takes place. So when this war happens and all the world's attention is on the Middle East with all these nations, Turkey, Russia, Iran, and others, attacking Israel, I believe that is when the church is going to be raptured and then God is going to pivot back to the nation of Israel to restore his covenant with his covenantal people for what? For the last seven-year period of time, which is the tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel, which is for Daniel, his people, and his holy city, Jerusalem. So I believe we are very, very close to this battle and this war. One final scripture here, Romans chapter 11. This is New Testament now. Paul the Apostle speaking about the national salvation of Israel. Romans eleven fifteen, For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Speaking of God resurrecting the nation of Israel. He says in verse 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Their eyes have been blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And then it goes on to say that the giftings and the callings of God are irrevocable. So Israel has been blinded for 2,000 years to who Jesus is, national Israel. At this point, God is going to complete the fullness of the Gentiles. The last Gentile is going to get saved. The church age is going to be over. Jesus is going to rapture, I believe, his church to be with him in heaven, his bride. And then the blinders will be taken off of the nation of Israel's eyes and they will turn back to God. And at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus Christ will return to save them from the Antichrist and all of Israel shall be saved. So exciting that we're living in these days where we see these prophecies taking place right before our eyes. It reminds us that we should be ready for his return. He could come back any time for his church there's nothing else that has to happen before the rapture occurs. It can happen any day, even today. So let's pray that we're salt and light in these last days. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the promises in your word. Thank you that you tell us the future in advance so that we might know that you are the God who inspired your word, the Bible. Lord, thank you, Father, for Israel and for what a great uh, example they are of your mercy, Lord. You're so merciful to your people. Lord, you will not cast away your people. You will fulfill all of your promises and covenants to Israel and to us in the church. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem today, Lord. We pray, Father God, that your people Israel would have their eyes opened to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior and their Messiah. Use us, Father, in these last days to be your hands and feet and to be salt and light in the world. Help us to preserve what is right, Lord, and to expose what happens in the darkness, Lord God, to shine your light everywhere we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.